I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo and me. Johnny is out sick today, but we're excited to introduce our guest, Pedro Gonzalez, an editor at Chronicles Magazine, to the show today. Thanks for joining us, Pedro. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having me. So Pedro is going to chat with us today about the subject of manhood and masculinity in America today, which will nicely complement a previous episode we recorded with the writer and self-proclaimed reactionary feminist Mary Harrington. Uh, We actually had a lot of listener questions this week about your thoughts on masculinity, Pedro. So before our conversation, which I hope will help answer those questions, I'll ask one of them, which is from Casey, who is interested in hearing from Pedro about how he balances intellectual pursuits and physical exercise and what he thinks about the relationship between the two. I think that they're fundamentally connected. I had a mentor who told me, and we might get into this later, that mental toughness and physical toughness are one and the same. And someone who has been a kind of affirmation of this idea with me was a Japanese philosopher named Yukio Mishima. And he compares the body to an orchard, or I should say the psyche, that Basically, if you let your orchard, your body, lie fallow, then it makes sense that the the mind will follow. And so I think that these two things are intimately connected. Finding the time to balance them, basically your intellectual pursuits and your physical pursuits, that's the tricky part, especially in this business, because we never sleep, but it's important. Uh, I, I try to make time to always go and get my my stuff in at the gym, usually pretty late at night, actually. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers that. I think this is primarily a Twitter thing, but I've, I've seen it also like written about, um, in, in the pejorative sense, of course, about the, um, kind of the right wing, like Twitter physique posting, um, like the, the gym bros. And I'm like interested in hearing, I mean, I'm, I'm not a man, obviously. So I'm interested in hearing both your thoughts on like how that even emerged because it doesn't seem like it's. It, it doesn't seem like it's, you know, an older thing. It seems like it's it, it kind yeah. of like cropped up all at once. It seems like it was memed into the mainstream by people in Bronze Age perverts sphere of influence. But it has its excesses. I mean, some of this stuff gets kind of silly, but at the same time, it's it's a natural reaction to an era that hates men and wants men to become effeminate and weak. So... I can't basically as much as there are, there are these kind of silly accesses to it where the wrong people can get kind of caught, caught in the uh, in the crossfire. I ultimately am obviously in favor of of uh, the the physi- uh, physiognomy checks and the physique posting. I think that this is good. David French just published an article called The Dangerous Cult of, of Manhood, something along those lines in The Atlantic, basically excoriating uh, this this glorification of men. The timing seems pretty bad, doesn't it? We, again, this is a time that hates men. Uh, think of the Gillette commercial uh, that makes fun of all of these different aspects that we just kind of find normal with, with manhood and boyhood, right? These things are all inherently bad. And I, I'm really curious, Pedro, since you're someone who obviously you know moves in a lot of these spaces to get into some of the questions of parsing apart in the digital space where there are excesses and where there are sort of negative influences and where there are a- aspects of the the kind of digital community that you're talking about that are, are beneficial or are worth um, supporting. But I, before we continue, I want to encourage our student listeners to consider applying for ISI's honor program, which has a t- January 22nd deadline. Um, the honors program is ISI's most selective program, and it's a week of reading groups and discussions with ISI's top faculty members and our best students, um, and it's entirely free. So if you're a student interested in the things that ISI does, uh, I'd encourage you guys to, to sign up. Um, and I also wanted to add to Nate's point is that we have uh, honor scholars who come from backgrounds in journalism, economics, business, philosophy, the fine arts, and pre-professional tracks. So if you're interested in exploring perennial ideas and conservative thought, um, I'd love to see your application. 
So for books of the week this week, since we're on the subject of masculinity, Pedro, are there any books or other media that influence your thinking on the subject? On masculinity? I can't, I mean, apart from Yukio Mishima's uh, The Sun and Steel, which, like I said, I read that much later, actually. Uh, my ideas on masculinity and manhood were actually not informed by reading anything, but actually engaging in the physical. My life before entering the, I, I have a very non-standard background for people in this industry, but before entering the verbalist arena, my life revolved around the physical. So I mean, we can we can talk about that, but uh, unfortunately, I don't. I, I'm not someone who's well versed in things like the uh, the manosphere or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all of those things actually came much later, and I found that they kind of corresponded with the things that I had just sort of intuited or learned on my own as someone who was not at all interested in intellectual pursuits until the last maybe five years. Are there any, um, maybe perhaps not books, but are there any figures um, like, you know, male figures, um, whether it's, I mean, it doesn't have to be like political, but um, who have kind of exuded this type of like, even if it's not, you know, physiognomy, but like just characteristics like courage and heroism that have kind of resonated with, with you on the masculinity point? Initially, one of my earliest heroes was actually Arnold Schwarzenegger. But this was long, long before he kind of went insane and became just a sort of uh, aging uh, progressive. Sad. It's very sad to see him go that way. But he was. He was a huge inspiration on me to start picking up weights. I grew up lifting weights every morning of high school and then continued doing that. Like I kept that habit through most of my life, listening to Bruce Springsteen. It made a huge impression on me. I, I wanted to basically develop myself physically as close as I could to someone like that without obviously doing steroids or anything like that. And apart from him, I don't know how, but at some point when I was really young, I came across the story of Thermopylae. And this is, it sounds so boring now because, you know, it's been a uh, it's been basically ruined by Zack Snyder's 300 film. Like everyone, it's like a meme now, right? Everyone knows about 300 and the Spartans and stuff. But that, but the the actual the original story as a kid growing up that actually made a huge impression on me, and it probably encouraged me to pursue for almost a decade this desire to enlist in the military. We'll get right to um, our interview um, right after I thank everyone for listening to Conservative Conversations. And uh, just to remind you, this is this podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate, Intercollegiate Studies Institute and our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you would like to help us in that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Without further ado, we'll get right to um, the meat of this interview and, you know, First of all, I mean, you've already alluded to kind of uh, your unconventional background, Pedro. So if you want to, you know, just kind of give us a uh, kind of what the, that landscape looks like um, as far as how, you know, you're, you're now working at um, Chronicles. You're, you're putting a lot. I mean, I was reading your spectator piece on, um, on sports. <laughs> so what, you know, what, what did your background look like? Yeah. So I, I'll just give you like a brief jumbled overview and then you can pick and choose what you want to get at. So like I said, I had tried for nearly a decade to enlist in the military, but unfortunately I was born with a rare medical condition. Not a big deal for me, but for the military, it's, it was a permanent disqualification, which means that the chances of actually enlisting are slim to none. So I, I also couldn't hide it. I have 15 surgical scars on my arms and legs. So it's not something like asthma that you can just fake, right? So I spent a lot of time initially with the Marines and the Navy and the Army trying to get in. I had letters of support from active and retired members of the special operations community. I even had a congressman, Duncan Hunter, although he's fallen from grace now, uh, try to help me, but I ultimately could not defeat the medical bureaucracy. But during that time, I was always engaged in physical things. Like I said, I, I was always reading and writing, uh, but it the things that I was reading, the things that I was writing were not at all philosophical or intellectual. It was more of just like reflections on personal stuff. But during that time, I did a variety of different things. Like I took up Thai boxing and became a trainer at a club for a while. Uh, I learned a lot from getting my um, my butt kicked. Uh, and I met a lot of salty people that made a, a good impact on my life in retrospect. Uh, but during that time, 
I also went through a lot of personal things like my half sister with whom I was very close growing up became a heroin addict and did things that alienated uh, her from our family. And I remember driving her to re rehab and, you know, listening to Freebird, which was her favorite song and kind of having to be the adult that grows up real fast, you know, and I, you know, I, I also watched my, my father decline and die due to Alzheimer's. And uh, th this is, Looking back on this, this is what I mean, that I, I think my mentor was right when he said that there is a fundamental connection between physical fitness and mental toughness, because I don't know what I would have done during all of this stuff if I didn't have a physical outlet, if I didn't have some place to go and, you know, smash like a punching bag or do some kind of, of physical training or something like that. So go ahead, Nate. Well, actually, I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your final thoughts on that, but I, I had a question on as an, as an addendum to that, cause it, it relates to the, your, your take on sports, um, that, that Marlo mentioned. Cause I, I was sort of surprised to hear that take from you for, for listeners who aren't familiar, um, Pedro wrote a piece in the spectator, really good piece. Um, I disagreed with the second half of the thesis about sports. I agreed with the first half about pornography, about why, um, watching sports is something that, uh, is, is, is generally not good for, for Americans. Cause I had a, a similar experience growing up in terms of having been an athlete, you know, from, for most of my life, my parents were both college athletes. I wasn't um, into lifting weights like you, my, you know, I, my parents are endurance athletes and I did endurance sports, but for me, this, the same way as you just articulately described more than reading anything, learning about masculinity and manhood had everything to do with my experience on teams, you know, playing, playing sports and, a large part of the culture surrounding that had to do with, you know, sports culture in terms of watching sports, talking about sports teams, the whole sort of sports fandom that I think you were critical of in, in, um, in that piece in the spectator. Uh, so I, I take your critiques about the, the sort of uh, the fat overweight beer drinking man watching, you know, uh, football every, every Sunday and why that's obviously something that we should be critical of. But I also think there's, there's something worth fighting for in sports fandom because it's sort of one of the last refuges of masculinity in America in an increasingly feminized uh, public sphere as you talk about. So I'm curious how you sort of delineate between the two if you're critical of fandom, but you and I agree that sports themselves are an honorable pursuit. My critique is mostly directed at the excess of sport fandoms. The, the man who lets himself physically deteriorate while wearing another man's jersey. I think that there is something just wrong about that. Intuitively, you can see the, the, the absurdity of that, right? Uh, the man who is extremely out of shape and then criticizes the professional athlete because he didn't uh, make a certain move or something like that. I think that also, although I'm obviously right now talking mostly about the effeminization of men, I think there's also another problem is that we don't really have a conception of what a, a healthy masculinity or manhood looks like. Is it the is it the bro the guy that goes to the bar and might be you know more fit than the other guy that i just described but ultimately has like a really uh bad conception of of what it means to be a man that being a man just means uh kind of you know publicly denigrating women and like smashing beers and stuff like that and this i don't know how else to describe it here i um this kind of unironically bad bro culture bad because it's like a perpetual childhood, right? It's someone who is going to have a really difficult time. Ultimately, this is this hurts them. This is someone who's going to have a difficult time having like a healthy relationship, settling down, getting married and having kids and starting a family because they're basically just a child. They're a huge child. It doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, if they go to the gym or not, right? So this is another side of this of this problem is what does healthy masculinity look like in a way that is not just a bait and switch where healthy masculinity, healthy masculinity is actually the glorification of weakness and turning men into this kind of, uh, I don't know, this David French model, right? Where weakness is actually strength and we have to kind of just take everything lying down. And like I said, it's a bait and switch because ultimately healthy masculinity is redefined into being effeminate. So th there's another side of this coin, which is, like I said, what is the the conception of manhood that we actually want. And I don't think it's the, the barstool conception of manhood. So I, I think part of recovering a healthy conception of masculinity in America has to do with rebuilding traditionally male spheres, right? And that's why I, I think there's a, a kind of sports fandom that's, that's worth defending because it's one of the last 
acceptable male spheres in America. Um, what what would that look like? What would that project look like um, in, in your conception? What would rebuilding male spheres look like? What should we be trying to rebuild? Um, and what new sort of male or male-friendly spheres should we be trying to build? And how should they be structured to inculcate a masculinity that is healthier than, um, as you rightly point out, uh, wearing another man's jersey, right? Uh, or just being sort of overweight and drinking beer? Because obviously, you know, we agree that that is not what American men should look like. Yeah. Well, to reiterate the point that I made at the start here, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with just hanging out with your friends and watching sports. My, my critique was mainly leveled at the excessiveness aspect of this, the obsession, right? So that's, that doesn't go out the window. If people like you, who are obviously uh, not the person that I've described, want to watch sports with your friends, uh, I'm not going to uh, break down your door and arrest you as the fun police. But I, I also don't think you can I solve this that, problem. Baby. Yeah, no problem. I also don't think you can solve this problem, or I should say there is no solution at scale. This is something that we can do and only can do with each other and our friend and our friends and our, our basically our circles, our spheres of influence with our friends and family. We can hold each other ac accountable. We can form whether it is physical fitness clubs, which I keep hearing of people like in my circle that are starting these up. Basically, uh, people wake up early. They'll go to like a local high school and they'll do a workout at the track. And usually these also entail readings, uh, workouts in the mornings and then readings in the evenings. This is basic stuff that you can do, I think, that, again, it's, it doesn't satisfy the answer of, like, what kind of policy can we implement to, you know, convert men into real men? Can we put uh, HGH in the water instead of fluoride? You know, can we make steroids mandatory or something like that? No, I, I think, unfortunately, this is we have to reconstruct this from the ground up. And ultimately, what makes it so difficult is it is entirely dependent on, account, on accountability on us holding each other accountable and holding ourselves accountable. So I know there, there's been some like renewed interest in um, the two income household and how uh, a single income household is, would, you know, kind of maximize, um, especially, I mean, just a, a man's ability to spend time with uh, his family, be the primary breadwinner. Um, and for uh, there not being a necessity of two people working. And what I think, I, I I believe it was Elizabeth Warren who wrote um, the two income trap, like, you know, what seems like eons ago. But I'm curious if you think that there's like some sort of economic configuration that would have to take place for a restoration of like, I mean, obviously the, the role of being primary breadwinner is, is one that requires a lot of sacrifice and sacrifice is notably a, a characteristic that I think the left has been hell bent on um, taking away from taking away from men and in that way emasculating them. So I'm curious if you think that there's like some sort of economic solution to this or if it is um, or if you're of the of the camp that it, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's something that has to take place on like a fundamentally like different level. I think both. I, I am a everything in the kitchen sink approach to these things. So I think that my well, my view of economics is that the economics should actually be subordinate to something right. like to use a phrase that is very scary these days, uh, the good, right? And what I mean by that is I think it is appropriate and better for families to get by on a single family income. But that statement is just a statement, right? We have to actually think this through and figure out, well, what would that actually mean in terms of economic policy? What would that actually mean in terms of society and the way that we look at the relations between men and what are basically men and women? Uh, this sounds like too theoretical, but when you consider the fact that even conservatives, look at the Republican Party's official Twitter account, and you'll see things like Joe Biden has been horrible for women in the workplace, that under his policies, more women than ever have been uh, exiled from the work, more mothers, actually, this is actually a tweet from the GOP along these lines, that we basically, we need to get mothers back into the workplace. We need to get mothers away from children, in other words. Th this is not, these are not radical feminist Marxists. Th these are uh, policymakers on the conservative side of things. And so this is what I mean is we, we have to go past, you know, just making a statement like single family income and really think through the implications of this. So for, for my part, this is, this is what I'm doing. I work a lot. I have a lot of different things going on so that my wife doesn't have to work. But something that I've learned because uh, we're talking about manhood, but I'm still growing up is that there, there's a there's a give and take here, right? 
it's I think it's kind of or might be kind of jarring for a lot of women who grew up in this era to basically acclimate themselves to being stay at home moms, even if they really want to. Right. I think it's it's kind of like a culture shock. And so ultimately, ultimately, what I realize is that on the one hand, I'm I'll, my work allows my wife to raise our kids properly, to actually raise them, not just feed them and keep them alive. Right. To actually raise them and inculcate values in them and things like that. But on the other hand, uh, I've, I've re- realized that my wife is also basically uh, providing all of these uh, care services for my kids. I, I don't. I'm not trying to to demystify this. What I mean by that is that I, I really appreciate all the things that stay at home uh, moms do now even more because it is basically a 24 hour a day job, never stops. They never get any breaks, and it kind of reminds you that uh, that this is a give and take. I wrote a piece a few years ago, actually, for the spectator as well, about how I like wanted to be what people were calling a um, a trad wife. Like, you know, I mean, I I think the the term is stupid, but I like I I go to a traditional Latin mass community, so it's um, there's a Catholic Mothers Association who um, they're they're stay at home moms, and you know, it's a very kind of traditional family format, and they have like several children, and they are. I mean, like you mentioned, they're not just doing what I think a lot of women today would suspect is, or they would, they would say is um, like housework and cooking. It's like they're, they're raising children, they're teaching them, um, they're homeschool moms. So they're, they're acting as teachers, they're doing home economics. I mean, the, just the, you know, the nuts and bolts that go into operating a household. Um, And I think it was um, Yoram Hazoni who pointed this out is, on, on Twitter the other day is the, you know, the family as a unit is a business and what the woman does at home, if she is a stay at home mother, um, isn't just uh, frivolous tasks to make sure that her husband has uh, food on the table when he gets home and that her kids are fed, but is really making sure that the, 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 you know, the heart of the home is alive and that there is um, that children are being raised to understand what um, like you know, just just to be good citizens, um, to be able to contribute to their communities because of what they've been taught in the home. Um, So I I think it seems like altogether the, there there has been kind of a, uh, and I'm guilty of it myself, but um, this lens that all women, um, my generation of millennials, whether it's millennials or Gen Z to look through has been primarily focused on like, they they think, what would I do if I was home all day? Um, It's like, well, I mean, it's, it's not even a nine to five job. It's, it's, a, you know, it's more than a full time one. Yeah. I've, I've learned to really appreciate my wife for these things. And I, I, I actually don't think you can come to appreciate it enough uh, because like you said, and like I said, it, it never stops for them. So. And something that our uh, listener, one of the listener questions we, we went through was they're particularly interested in how masculinity and um, the American understanding of masculinity and kind of the campaign to um, disabuse men of wanting to lean into that, um, how that influences national security. So that was something that a listener was interested in specifically how, I mean, I saw this piece about how China's education ministry made plans to like cultivate masculinity, masculinity in boys starting in like kindergarten. And it had this physical education component that was geared toward like specifically promoting masculinity um, because like s- some Chinese official, officials said they were experiencing a masculinity crisis. And uh, officials even said the issue was one of national security. So, I mean, part of me is skeptical that at the deepest levels of the, like the American national security apparatus that this uh, behavior from like our main geopolitical uh, adversary um, isn't concerning to them. But I'm also, I saw the CIA video trending on Twitter like a few months back. So I'm not quite sure, like, do they have, do they have knowledge that this is a, a legitimate threat or, or not? I'm not sure. And I think that the easy, I say easy, like it's a bad thing, but I've made this too. The, the I should say the obvious critique here is that basically, if you don't care about masculinity, if you don't care about cultivating real men, you're going to have a hard time winning wars, right? If you prize things like diversity and inclusion above cultivating war fighters, then yeah, you're going to have a difficult time beating anybody, right? But I think there's another aspect of this that matters and maybe it doesn't get said enough, which is I think it's barbaric. I think that's the appropriate term to use too. It is psychotic and barbaric that we're 
excited about sending women off to die. That that is that is I, barbaric is the right word because I mean ancient societies are very egalitarian in the sense that women got to live and die alongside the men. Uh, they were treated just as brutally and they were killed just as brutally, right? So I mean I think Phyllis Schlafly actually made this point against feminists in her time, which was that that our society had finally at last actually put women on a pedestal where they were viewed as basically something worth protecting and uh, respecting and kind of keeping away from the front lines, right? We've done the opposite. Now the, the metric of progress for us is how many women, how many female bodies we're willing to throw at some, uh, some war that is totally unnecessary and absurd. Like that is, that is the thing by which we judge the progress in societies, how many women we're going to kill. Uh, over like you know Taiwan or something like that, like that it to me, that to me is absolutely psychotic. It's anti-life. It's a society that really has no sense of of its own impending demise. I want to ask you about something we've sort of been dancing around a little bit um, in, in a bunch of these different questions, which is the relationship between masculinity in America, particularly in young men and digital spaces. I'm not someone who actually thinks Twitter is a hundred percent bad. I, I couldn't say that because I've met some really good friends that I hang out with regularly in person on Twitter. I've been plugged into a community I really appreciate. I've, uh, you know, had real actual sort of career opportunities through through being plugged into the the online communities. And I think it it provides young people and particularly young men a space to have conversations that you're not allowed to have in a lot of normal institutional spaces um, in America today. So that's that's sort of my my at least sort of half defense of something like Twitter. Um, but at the same time, even as it exposes young men to the sort of taboo ideas about masculinity that, that we're talking about, spending eight hours a day plus on Twitter um, is actually stunting your ability to become a, a healthy masculine man uh, in a lot of different ways, um, precisely because you're missing out on all of the sort of in-person associational things that you were talking about with examples like the the fitness groups and the reading groups that uh, that men are building. So you have this weird phenomenon of a lot of young men online talking incessantly about the necessity of touching grass and going outside and you know lifting weights, et cetera, et cetera, from behind their their laptop screens and and their their sort of engagements uh, in in those conversations is actually preventing them from doing the precise things that they say that they want to be doing and they want other men to be doing. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, this is sort of like something that I wrestle with, but how do you balance those two competing impulses? Because it does seem like digital spaces, at least for now, are the only place where you can really have those conversations. You can't talk about them in, in, the, in, in public anymore, but you also need to shut off Twitter and, and sh you know shut down your laptop eventually and actually go outside and start doing these things. Yeah, I think part of it is is a desire for authenticity and to become part of things that are difficult to join. And so like the, the physique posting sphere, the BAP sphere, whatever you want to call it, basically it's this, this side of Twitter. Um, and maybe we're even talking about two different things, but, but there is this, let's just say that there's a subsection of Twitter that is, as you described, very much concerned with masculinity, with manhood, with things like that. And I think the allure of it is precisely that, that it's, you want to be part of a club that is authentic and based basically on your adherence to, on the one hand, physical fitness, and on the other hand, to being a kind of dissident, right? Now, I think if you drink the Kool-Aid a little too deeply, you end up just spending all of your time online, which, like you said, uh, actually makes it difficult to, one, be physically fit, or two, a dissident, because ultimately, if, if your dissidence is just posting hot takes on Twitter, uh, that's that's not really going to do it. You know, uh, that's, you're just spinning your wheels at that point. And this kind of goes back to like why I wanted to enlist in the military. I saw it, well, on the one hand, of course, I wanted to fight for my country, but on the other hand, I saw it as the ultimate rite of passage because earning your place in these communities cannot be purchased with dollars, right? The price of admission is blood and sweat and struggle. And so at the time, it seemed like the most authentic thing that someone can do and certainly the ultimate test of manhood. Um, so I think that there is something of this going on in these Twitter spheres. You're trying to join a club, uh, where authenticity is the most valuable thing in a society that doesn't really care about that anymore. 
uh, and certainly doesn't care about manly dissidents. We try to, at every turn, stamp out dissidents and turn people into conformists, right? So uh, something that, I mean, obviously a lot of Twitter banter is uh, concerning like political, the political and political owns and things like that. So how do you think themes of masculinity and the role of masculinity plays into our political landscape? And maybe I'm just, I don't want to give an outsized uh, significance to Twitter just because I'm so on it and I recognize that. Um, but you, you mentioned earlier, David French published a piece this week about the new rights uh, accusations of um, masculinity aimed towards fusionists, classical liberals, et cetera. And uh, a few speakers at the National Conservatism Conference, which I wasn't at, but Nate was at um, this year in Orlando, they brought up the crisis of masculinity, both um, in the conservative movement and uh, segments of it. So I'm curious, like how you think the, there's interplay between masculinity and our political landscape at large? I think, unfortunately, a, a good example of this is someone like Trump. I don't actually think that Trump was the the caudillo, the strong man that he made himself out to be. It's not that I don't think, I know he wasn't. But he certainly had the put on, right? The put on of uh, the, the brash guy who just talks bluntly and says what's on his mind and is not afraid in theory, to stand up to to the oligarchs and all that stuff. And I think that, that that is what these people that we're talking about, whether they were at NatCon or whatever, I think that's what they're kind of getting at. That is the kind of politics we would like to see, in other words. Maybe a little bit more articulate, uh, but certainly just as, just as bold. Uh, not someone who slinks from confrontation and will say something that gets them in hot water not because it's controversial, but just because it's true, and then apologize, and then goes on an apology tour about it, right? Someone who just won't be cowed. I think that that is that is ultimately what is behind this desire for for representatives, for leaders who are just stronger, uh, not just more charismatic, but also just brave and stronger, and and have a willingness to fight. And I think that is that is something that was so central to Trump's success and popularity. That he was simply I mean, there's a, there's I think it's uh, an Abraham Lincoln quote about Ulysses S. Grant when he was not doing so hot. Um, there was some drama going on, and I think when it push came to shove, uh, Lincoln said like I I can't fire him because this man fights something along those lines, right? That that is what is behind this desire for masculine politicians, or I should say leaders, because when you look at people like French. When you look at people who represent the conservative movement, these are people that at critical junctures often side with the left in denouncing the right, right? Whether it is like the Covington Catholic thing, sorry, Nate, I know you work there, but National Review was the first, one of the first places that jumped on the, on the Covington kids, right? They sided with the guy beating the drum against them. I think they recanted it afterwards. Uh, but that is the kind of thing that I think people just find appalling. On the political level, uh, you look to Republicans like Ron Johnson and these other kind of Republicans who just kind of uh, stink of weakness. And I think that is, again, that is what, what is behind this healthy desire for, for just politicians, for leaders, intellectual and political, who will stand their ground and fight for what is right. So I think, you know, you're talking about a disposition towards politics that, that I, I broadly agree is necessary, particularly looking, looking at the state of the contemporary Republican Party where it's, it's sorely lacking. I, I am curious, though, about in terms of like a substantive policy agenda, we're talking about a lot of things that personally young boys and young men need to do to go out to actually learn how to become men. And obviously, that's crucially important. Any kind of renewal of a healthy masculinity can't happen without men actually deciding that they want to be men again. Um, but you said earlier, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree that things like economics need to be subordinate to a, a broader vision of the good. Um, and obviously policy has a, has a role to play in that. So what would a substantive policy platform or what would some policies look like that could actually help along the way to renewing a healthy masculinity? And I think probably in tandem, a healthy femininity because the two are uh, in some ways inextricably linked. I'm not sure, again, that you can kind of snap your fingers and push these. I mean, you can look at the, the most obvious example, the easy way out of this question for me would be to say, look at Hungary. 
and look at the policies that they've implemented and also the constitutional amendment that they've created, that they've added, which is to say that families are defined as man and woman uh, and that gender roles are defined in a Christian context. These kinds of things are conducive to generative traditional conceptions of male and female. But on the other hand, I think you can look at topical, I should say current events examples, or they were current events, like Trump tweeting about law and order a hundred times, but not actually doing anything during the riots because he was terrified of being perceived as a racist, of Trump talking about building the wall, but not actually forcing uh, the, wall, the wall to be built because of, on the one hand, uh, incompetence from guys like Chad Wolf and DHS, and on the other hand, the Pentagon just not, you know, not releasing the funds and things like that, or Trump threatening to invoke the Insurrection Act uh, to stop illegal immigration at the border or to stop rioting, and then not actually doing it because of, at the pivotal moment he's afraid, right? Or withholding legislation like the uh, ending the birthright citizenship in the United States. That's something else that Trump didn't pull the trigger on, simply because I think the implications uh, would be way too much for him to handle. Uh, he, he was, in other words, he was just afraid of it. People have pretty much, people who worked in the administration have pretty much admitted as much that despite the rhetoric, despite the, uh, the, the, you know, the barn burning speeches and all that stuff, uh, ultimately Trump was very worried about optics and about backlash and about being perceived in a certain way. So I think that in my world, uh, we would have a Trump who wouldn't be afraid of doing things like that, of ignoring, you know, the Pentagon's decision that, well, actually redirecting funds to our border uh, distracts from our missions overseas to protect other people's borders and then finding a way to force that to happen. Or like I said, invoking the Insurrection Act during nationwide riots, things like that. That is, in my view, a kind of masculine uh, leader who would actually do these things despite the the pushback from the media or from the establishment. Because, you know, we talk about draining the swamp. Uh, the swamp is not going to dra drain itself and it's not going to go quietly. So I think that is why there is, again, this desire for leaders who are willing to, to take these risks, these manly risks. Do you see any politicians, presumably on the, on the Republican side, who exemplify those virtues or at least have some of them and are sort of pointing towards that today, either in the sort of farm leagues down at the state level or, or at the national level, or are you just totally blackpilled on every single elected Republican politician in America today? So I am very careful to not endorse anyone because I try to remain independent. But I do think that although Ron DeSantis does bait and switch and will do things uh, that seem really based on the surface... But then you like follow up and you realize, oh, he didn't actually go through with this. DeSantis is what I, what I call the best of the worst. I'm not, I'm not calling him a grifter. Uh, I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm actually complimenting him just in the way that uh, I know how. Uh, but DeSantis is one of the only people that will say things like after the Waukesha killings recently, he said that the killer had anti-white political views and that the media cares more about like, you know, nonsense controversies than a guy who is influenced by, who supports BLM, supports the Black Panthers, supports the Black Hebrew Israelites, driving his car into a Christmas parade. Like DeSantis was, I think he's the only person that's pointed this out. And he was also one of the only people that passed legislation, although I, I think it was ultimately much weaker than the media made it seem to be initially, but he, he at least introduced legislation that would allow store owners to defend themselves with use of force against looters during the riots. So I think DeSantis exhibits the possibility of, of this kind of strong, manly leadership. Uh, whether he himself ultimately lives up to it, I think that's the jury is still out on that. But like I said, he's like the closest thing that I've seen to someone who's really willing to take risks on things that are extremely controversial. Before we, we have to wrap up in a few minutes, but I did want to ask, um, we, we talked about China earlier. And I'm, I'm curious if you think that this like crisis in masculinity that the U.S. is facing, if um, obviously other, uh, you mentioned Hungary, China earlier, they clearly have a, a grip on what's going on. They're trying to um, kind of put a pause on uh, what's happening as far as um, men go and ma or masculinity goes and how the, especially the U.S. has kind of um, has kind of promoted their kind of HR vision of what, you know, what men should look like. 
and uh, how and, and their role in society. So I'm curious if you think that other countries will kind of fall in line with this um, this concept that like, especially with tox toxic masculinity being kind of the buzzword du jour, or do you think they'll like act in self-interest and uh, kind of take the the models of um, like, I guess, China, Hungary, some some other Eastern European countries, I guess Russia is one of them um, and yeah. try to, you know, put a pause on on what's happening in, in the US and in the rest of uh, Western Europe. So I think that right now, unfortunately, one of the things that we export is this problem. Uh, wokeism or whatever I mean, you can just call it, really just modern liberalism, is the ideological export of the United States. And I think that the more another country embraces ideas that are coming out of the United States establishment today, the more likely it is to fall victim to this stuff. And so that's why I think countries like countries like Hungary are in this paradoxical position where they're, you know, trying to ingratiate themselves to the United States on the one hand, but then also, you know, making gestures uh, that they kind of reject Western liberalism. Uh, that is why Hungary has been accused of, it, rightly so, uh, illiberalism, right? But I've wondered if China is going to go down the same road because as it opens up to U.S. influence and tries to do things that we're doing uh, to beat us at our own game, that maybe they'll eventually fall victim to this. I think there, I think there was an article recently uh, by some, it's like China's secret philosopher, and he kind of touches on this, that this is a kind of Western problem, this zeitgeist of decline and femininity. And so it stands to reason that if other countries imitate us, that unfortunately they're probably going to succumb to the same thing. So I, I, I think um, this could be the topic of an entirely different discussion, but Guys like Darren Beatty talk about this, that uh, it's it's difficult, right, for conservatives, for right-wingers to kind of swallow this pill. But the, the reigning ideology, the reigning state religion of the United States is exactly uh, this, this thing that we're discussing, this thing that encourages men to act, to act unmanly and for women to act like men. So... Well, Pedro, thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? So unfortunately, I am on Twitter at E-M-E-R-I-T-I-C-U-S, and you can find me on pretty much every other, uh, sadly, every other uh, known social media uh, under that handle, e uh, Emeriticus. And uh, most of my writing these days takes place at chroniclesmagazine.org or my newsletter at contra.substack.com. Great. Thanks again for joining us, Pedro. And thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.